Godot basics. Among Godot's many classes, there's one that I use all the time, but hardly ever see mentioned, which I think is a real shame, as it's incredibly useful. So, in light of that, let me introduce you to Geometry 2D. This is a special helper class that isn't used to hold any data or represent a node. Instead, this class simply contains a series of methods that give you a short and easy way to do a multitude of geometry operations. So let's dive in, starting with the simplest category of methods, that being the ones that all share a vector as their first argument and return information based on the position of the point said vector represents. With the first two of whom being the duo of get closest point to segment and get closest point to segment uncapped which both take three vectors as arguments and return another vector representing the closest point on the line segment defined by the second and third argument to the point defined by the first, with the latter treating the defined line segment as if it were infinite in length. Following after those is a trio of aptly named methods that all return a bool based on if the given point is inside the named shape. Beginning with point is inside triangle, which takes four vectors as arguments with the last three defining the triangle. Then we have is point in circle, which takes two vectors and a float as arguments with the second vector defining the circle's position and the float defining the circle's radius. And the final member of the trio is point in polygon uses a packed vector to array, basically just an array of vectors, to define the polygon you want to check the point against. Now with that category covered, let's move on to the next, which is a natural evolution of the previous, being a series of methods that return information based on the positions and intersections of lines and line segments. Beginning with line intersects line, which uses four vector arguments to define two lines. With the first and third arguments setting an anchor point for each line, and the second and fourth arguments representing the direction each line points returning either a vector for the intersection point or a null if the lines don't intersect at all. To go with that, the next method, segment intersects segment, also takes four vector arguments. This time to define line segments rather than full infinite length lines. And as such, the second and fourth vectors represent the endpoint of their respective line segment instead of just a direction. That said, this method also still returns either a vector representing the intersection position or null if they don't intersect at all. After that is get closest points between segments, which takes the same arguments as the previous method, returning an array containing two vectors representing the closest point on each of the defined segments. And the last method in this category is segment intersect circle, taking three vector arguments and a float with the first two vectors defining a line segment, third vector defining the circle's position, and the float defining said circle's radius, returning a float that will either range from 0 to 1 if the segment and circle intersect, or just be negative 1 if not. Now, this returning a float at first glance may seem random, but it represents where along the line segment the intersection occurred, with 0 being the start of the segment and 1 being the end of the segment, and can be used to get the exact intersection position. Moving forward, the next category of geometry 2D methods is where things start to get complicated, as they all take a packed vector to array as their first argument and use those points to generate different kinds of, and sometimes multiple, polygons. Starting with convex hull, which returns a single packed vector to array representing a convex hull polygon that encompasses all the points within the given array. Note that the last entry of the returned packed vector to array will always be a duplicate of the first entry. Though typically this won't matter, it can come up. Also, for those unaware, a polygon being convex simply means that it only has interior angles of 180, or if you prefer, pi radians, or less between each of its points. Anyway, after that we have a similar yet significantly more complex method, that being triangulate Delaunay which, true to its name, performs a Delaunay triangulation. In simple terms, that means that this method calculates the minimum amount of, as large as possible, discrete triangles that connect all the points within the given array, returning the result as a packed int32 array, aka an array of integers. Now that last part probably sounded pretty weird. After all, how can an array of integers be the result of calculating a bunch of triangles? Well, said array will contain three integers for each calculated triangle, these integers representing each of the triangle's corners, and said integers will correspond to the index of the point they represent within the original given array. A thing to note about this is that when all the triangles are put together, they end up resulting in the exact same shape as our previous method, convex hull. So keep that in mind and use the former when you don't need all the individual triangles as it's significantly cheaper computationally. Moving on, we have another triangulation method, 
Triangulate Polygon. Unlike the previous two methods, which didn't need the vectors within their packed vector2 array argument to be in a particular order, this one and all following methods need their vectors inside the array to be ordered sequentially. This method then takes that polygon and calculates all the triangles needed to fill it in, returning the result as a packed int32 array. Said returned array works the same way as the array returned by the previous method. Note that if the given array did not define a valid polygon, the return array will be empty. Following those is the comparatively simple decompose polygon and convex, which breaks the given polygon apart into individual convex polygons, returning the result as an array of packed vector2 arrays. Next, there's offset polygon, taking three arguments and inflating or deflating the given polygon by the value of its float argument. With how each corner of the polygon is joined back together after said inflation being determined by its integer argument, said integer corresponds to a poly join type enumeration with zero being square mode and the default, causing each of the little polygon's corners to be squared off, one being round mode, causing each of the little polygon's corners to be rounded off, and two being emitter mode, causing most of the inflated polygon's corners to end in extremely sharp points. Though if the angle between the edges is too extreme, it will instead become squared off. Also note that this can result in multiple individual polygons, hence why it returns an array of packed vector2 arrays instead of just a packed vector2 array by itself. If the points in the given array are arranged in a way that would produce an invalid polygon, and moving on to the last method in this category, we have offset polyline, which uses the exact same arguments as the previous method with the addition of another integer, and this inflates the line rather than the polygon created by the given array again returning the result as an array of packed vector2 arrays. That said, the previously mentioned new integer argument represents the poly n-type enumeration, with 2 being butt mode, causing the line to just abruptly end at the final points, 3 being a square mode, causing the end of the line to also be inflated along with everything else, but still be squared off, and 4 being round, also causing the end of the line to be inflated, but rounded. Now you may have noticed I skipped the poly n types of 0 and 1, and that's because they are weird relative to the rest, with 0 being a polygon mode and simply returning an error if you try to use it, and 1 being joined mode, connecting the line's endpoints, forming a polygon, and then expanding said polygon. This, of course, is effectively the same as just using the previously covered offset polygon, and as such, you should typically just use that instead when needed. Something to be aware of with this method is that if the given polyline overlaps itself, the enclosed area will get filled in. Alright, so with all those out of the way, we can move on to the last large category of methods, all of whom take two packed vector2 arrays representing polygons as their only arguments and use the second polygon to perform a boolean operation on the first. The simplest of these methods is merge polygons, which simply takes the two polygons and returns an array of packed vector2 arrays representing either a combined polygon if they overlap or just duplicates of the originally given polygons if not. Following after that is clip polygons, which attempts to clip the first polygon against the second, again returning the result as an array of packed vector2 arrays. Be aware that if the second polygon completely envelops the first, then the returned array will be empty, since the entire polygon is being clipped. However, if the opposite occurs, the first polygon completely enveloping the second, the returned array will contain two polygons, representing the polygon's boundary and hole. These can be distinguished with one of Geometry 2D's other, more miscellaneous functions, is polygon clockwise, which, as the name suggests, returns a bool based on if the given polygon is clockwise, which the inner polygon always will be and the inner polygon always won't be. Anyway, moving on to the next method is clip polyline with polygon, which is very similar to the previous, except that it treats the first given array as if it defines a polyline rather than a filled polygon returning the result as an array of packed vector2 arrays. Effectively, this makes it so that you're cutting a line with a closed shape. Next is intersect polygons, which returns an array of packed vector2 arrays representing only areas where the given polygons intersect. If there is no intersection, then the returned array will be empty. Also, like the previous method, this has a polyline variant. That being intersect polyline with polygon, which works the same, but treats the first given array as if it defines a polyline rather than a filled polygon. And with that, we're at the last method of this category, and second last method within Geometry 2D itself, exclude polygons. 
which is meant to return an array of packed vector2 arrays that represent only the places the given polygons don't overlap. But there's a bit of a problem, as it seems to be fairly broken, as it will often return invalid polygons. That said though, you can work around this by simply calling the regular clip polygons on each shape and having them clip against each other. And now we move on to the final method, a method so unique relative to the rest that it gets a category all to itself. Make Atlas. This, as some of you likely suspect, based on the name, is meant to help streamline the production of texture atlases and sprite sheets at runtime. Taking a packed vector2 array as its only argument, representing the size of each tile you'll need in your atlas, and calculating the size said texture atlas would need to be in order to contain all the tiles and their positions within the atlas. Returning a dictionary with two entries. Points, which is a packed vector2 array representing the calculated tile positions listed in the order their sizes were provided, and size, which is a vector2i, meaning a 2D vector made of integers, representing the calculated size of the atlas. Note that even if the vectors given are all the same, the order they are given in can cause the value of the size entry to change, sometimes significantly. Now before closing out the video, I want to emphasize the point that you should only go through the trouble of using this method to create atlases when you specifically need to generate texture atlases at runtime. Because otherwise, Godot actually has a built-in and easy-to-use way of generating texture atlases for multiple images within the import tab. And there you go, basically everything you need to know about one of my favorite and more obscure classes within Godot. Hope you found this helpful, and please, if you have any feedback, be it advice, criticism, or ideas for future videos, let me know down in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe if you want to keep up with my future content. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching.